and then over there we have uh, Hazik, right? Uh, and also the from the data data council committee squad over there. All of us like to welcome you guys for data council's second meetup in KL. Yeah. Right, so last, last two months ago we had our first meetup and uh, we had a lot of feedback from you guys and uh, we'll be collecting feedback from you guys today as well. And over time we'd like to make this session a lot better. And uh, based on that, this is what we have in store for you guys today. First up, we'll go cover a little bit about what Data Council is. Uh, first time for Data Council, anybody? Okay, so this will be relevant. And then after that, we'll go to a segment called TDD or it's not test driven development, it's the data dump, we'll tell you more about it later. And then we have the main events, we have two talks by three awesome speakers, and finally we have a job pitch. Now the job pitch is gonna be a little bit more stricter than the last two months ago. Uh, we're gonna have one minute each person, and uh, if you're looking for a job, we will hand you the mic, and then you know you can talk about your experiences, what you're looking for, and if you're a company, you get a minute to pitch your company and on the job posts and stuff like that. Right? So a minute, and then after that, we'll you know, gently uh, take the mic from you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So before all of this, we'd like to give a special appreciation to REA Group. Right? They've been kind enough to sponsor the venue, host us here, and give the food, and also two of the data engineers are going to be sharing later in the talk. Yeah, and uh, here we have uh, Mr. Alaudin, who's the head of data science of RE Group. He'd like to welcome you guys, everybody. Right, also a special shout out to engineers.my who is recording this session at the back. And if you guys missed last uh, two months ago session, you guys can check it out on YouTube. Just go to engineers.my and the session is there. Okay, let's start with what is Data Council. So Data Council is a company that organizes data conferences worldwide. And uh, when it comes to data conferences, there are actually a lot of data conferences not only in KL, but uh, around the world, especially when it comes to the topic of data. In fact, last week, I think there was two in KL. The one, was, one of it was conference with the R, which is the R conference. And then there was a KL data science conference in APU or something like that. So there are a lot of conferences is what I'm getting at. And um, 
I'm not going to give you a thorough comparison of Data Council in every conference, but I'm, instead I'm going to give you two key, like key points or key differentiator of what makes Data Council different. And the first main point of what makes Data Council different is if you go to Data Council events, the, a lot of the attendees come out saying this, this motto, this thing that they try to try to say. They say this is a no bullshit data conference, right? And what is no bullshit? It basically means instead when you go to a conference, you're not being bombarded by marketing. You're not being bombarded by oh, here's the next tool to use, right? Or or just a bunch of hiring people telling you to come not nothing wrong with the hiring right it's more like if that's all you get it's kind of uh, you're spending a lot of money to go to a conference right so a lot of people who come out say this is the no bullshit data conference and if it's hard for you guys to visualize that all you have to do is well the best way to embody that culture is to go to a conference but that you could also go to youtube and type data council and you can actually search for all of their record all their sessions are recorded so you can listen to all of their talks from Data Council. And uh, the second differentiator of Data Council is they support local communities. So if you've ever been to a tech conference uh, that you like, and uh, what you realize is you might go in there, go there for a talk or for a speaker, but you'll actually stay there for the people, right? You'll stay there because the environment is so, I don't know, hype that you wanna be there for a longer time. So what they notice is this, this environment, they wanted to have it not just once a year, they wanted to have it uh, between conferences, right? So they have mini conferences like this, mini gatherings where you all can learn and grow together. And essentially, this is the KL chapter. And uh, yeah, they have about 14. And uh, in Southeast Asia, Bangkok is probably the happening one. KL, soon to be super happening, right? And uh, those are the conferences they have over there. Uh, so when it comes to why this is data council and this is why they do it when it comes to why we want to do it is essentially we want to give you guys the excuse or no excuse to go outside of singapore outside of malaysia and go to singapore indonesia and all the other countries to learn knowledge to gain knowledge we want you to be stay here and we want to try to bring together all the different companies and talent across kl and malaysia to share and so that we all can learn and grow together that's essentially why we are doing this so yeah, that's Data Council and that's Data Council KL. If you guys have any questions, I think that's my WhatsApp. Right, so if you guys have any questions uh, or you guys wanna help or maybe you wanna host the next one in your offices, you can come look for me, Alex or Hazik or I guess anyone wearing this Data Council t-shirt and we'll sort you out. Right, so now comes the segment that I like, the data dump. So the data dump is this segment we like, with, that's been inspired from uh, DevOps Malaysia. And essentially what the segment is about is uh, we will be sharing uh, things that we came across the past month or maybe more than that, that we think is worth sharing with you guys. And uh, yeah, so the last month uh, I shared this and this. So these two I think is super relevant when you get into data science. And uh, I, I think it's worth repeating for this month as well. First up is the Sequoia data blog. And the Sequoia data blog, you can think of it as a high level of uh, what you want to track, how do you want to track, uh, where does machine learning, where does data science, at what part of the product do you start introducing that? Uh, a lot of the things they cover, it's very, very thorough. Like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but there's all the way up to like uh, 30 something articles going pretty thoroughly but a little bit high level about what data science is in a company particularly i guess startups and then there is the gitlab data handbook if you want to go a little bit more in depth uh maybe how do you set up your teams so what kind of okrs do you want to set for your teams uh and gitlab if you guys don't know is a fully remote company so uh, they don't have employees in offices they instead so they rely on this handbook this is basically their onboarding and uh, they, they cover everything, right? What, what kind of data sources they pull from, when they pull it, how they pull it, a lot of different things they talk about in the data handbook. So if you guys are starting up, you know, building up different cultures and processes, you can go through the data handbook. Right, so I think this link was shared by Alex, yeah.
So this is an article that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, it's it's actually an article on uh, O'Reilly's data blog. Uh, it's by this guy called Jesse Anderson. So it's uh, pretty cool. It's more definitely aimed at a management audience. And this article basically highlights uh, the difference between the, the work of a data scientist and the work of a data engineer. And uh, it has lots of diagrams and lots of um, very cool explanations. And I think another thing to check out from the, the author of this article, Jesse Anderson, he actually has this book called Data Engineering Teams, which is uh, not really a very long book. It's a free ebook as well. Uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, my team at uh, Moneyline have actually gone through it and it's, we found it very helpful. So uh, it's something worth exploring for your own uh, data engineering teams. Um, the next article that I want to share, it's not really specific to uh, data science or data engineering, basically anyone working in tech in general. So this article is basically talking about a dear startup you have no idea how much that costs. And the gist of the article is that um, you want to refrain from giving an estimate to management because most of the time they will just discount whatever estimate that you give them. So you as, as the tech person should actually push for management to give you their budget and their timeline and you work around that instead. So that should be the way to go about it. And this, this article is actually pretty interesting because it goes into like the reasons why you shouldn't fall into the trap of giving an estimate and then only later to be told that you need to get this done in half the time and half the budget. So, and if they can't give you an estimate, uh, what the author argues is that that means it's probably not that important. So anyway, it's, it's, it's a lot, lots of things. So like the, the radical, the radical uh, solution proposed here is that, you know, no more estimates. We in the tech community should not give estimates, get management to tell us their, what they want. So um, that's basically it from me. Uh, next up is my colleague, Hazik. Yeah, so you can do the next one. How do I do this? Do you click? Do you do it? Oh. Yeah. Could I hold this? Yeah. Oh, you Well, hi guys. So I covered more on news in general. I didn't want to cover too much of the technical topics. I feel that these things are interesting and could be useful if you are actually working on new other data sets. So the first one I'm sharing is about how Bloomberg is moving their trading data, historic trading data to the cloud. So they're making it available for companies to actually access the data. So it will be very good if you dive in and check out what's up because you could potentially use it as a source to work with new models. It's very it's a very interesting thought. We haven't really I haven't personally dived into the actual data, but good to keep note of this one. Uh, the other one I want to highlight is about how Facebook is worried as well about the whole deepfake issue. I think everyone's starting to get worried. Credibility is going down with any sort of medium. So Facebook has posted a challenge or is about to announce the challenge proper. I haven't been too up to date with this on creating a data set that can challenge deepfake. So the idea is to create an algorithm that can identify somewhat accurately whether the image or video was created by a deepfake. So it's interesting. The links are up there. You can just click on when we share the sites over. And the third one and final one is the ghost tech powering tech. So uh, the ghost work powering tech. So uh, I think it's really important to remember that yes, we do do a lot of great work with technology and data, but you have to remember that data has to come from somewhere and someone's labeling and someone's annotating the data. So it's really important to keep in mind that whatever interactions you have with technology or data, it will initially go through human hands, right? So it's something I feel that you should keep note of and hopefully appreciate because there are a lot of people on Amazon Turk and a lot of people who have you know literally unpaid slave labor for this kind of stuff to make things happen so would highly appreciate if you guys checked out this article and really understand the implications of things so those are the three I'm covering so Ayas is this you all right cool back to Ayas So I wanted to share about Hortonworks and Cloudera. Maybe you guys heard of them. They're the huge uh, Hadoop distributors. And uh, they got, had a merger last year, I think. And a uh, couple of, I think they announced this early in the year, but uh, recent, more recent news is they wanted to build, or they're building a CDP. And there's so many abbreviations for CDP. There's like customer data platform, consumer data pipelines, 
blah, 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 a lot of abbreviations. But this one is Cloudera Data, Data what? Platform. Cloudera Data Platform, right? And uh, it's cool, even though not many people might, may not use Hadoop or, or, uh, or Hortonworks or Cloudera, it's good to know what they're moving towards. And what they're moving towards is, see this technical detail part, is uh, basically they're scrapping away HDFS to something like uh, an object store. Right, and on top of the object store, they have like Kubernetes on top running their workers instead of Yarn, which is what Hadoop used for, yeah. So this is a good read, I felt. And I um, wanted to also bring this topic about, which is data testing. Um, that big line over there, what if instead of reacting, you could proactively Pro, what, what if you could put proactive systems in place that would give you visibility of data problems, right? This is essentially testing in the data world. And uh, you see those two points, the engineering team was shipping new functionality and it changes something and the report broke, right? Something breaks when something changes. So this article is basically an article from DBT and it covers very thoroughly how, how you could get started with data testing what kind of test you would put, put in place and where. And uh, yeah, this is a pretty good article. And uh, yeah, just to segue into that, uh, there is this library called Great Expectations. You can start, just pip install Great Expectations. You can start your data testing already. Yeah, all right, that's, that's about it. Me, I think there's oh, another library. Okay, hello, uh, my name is Ash. Uh, I just didn't introduce me yet, but um, I'm not, one of the organizers of Data Council, but I sit in the WhatsApp group and I talk a lot, so that's why I'm here. Uh, so uh, I added like five things, which is way more than I should have. But um, so the first thing I wanted to share with everyone was this thing called Streamlit. So some of you guys probably saw this in the news last week. Uh, this company came out of, I think I would say stealth with $6 million in funding. And uh, the video unfortunately is not loading, but I'm just gonna open up a web. Uh, so you can see what it basically is. I think if you were to simply sum it up, is it's R shiny for Python. It allows you to basically build a uh, was that user interface from your Python code super easily, and it's as easy as stream pip install streamlit into your uh, into your module uh, into your Python code, which is pretty cool. So the, the, the video here is just showing like 23 streamlit function calls and he's basically built a full like kind of um, a, fill, a full kind of dashboard, so to speak. All right, so that's streamlit. can check that out as well later. Uh, so um, this is from a really cool newsletter that uh, called a Collier called the morning paper. So the guy who writes it is uh, acolier.org, A-C-O-L-Y-E-R.org. Uh, he reviews one computer science paper a day. So uh, also earlier this week, he uh, shared this paper on booking.com's lessons from deploying 150 models, 150 successful kind of machine learning models. And he summed it up as these six things, basically. So according to data, projects that, you know, that introduce machine learning models it deliver strong business value. So it's definitely something we should invest in. Uh, model performance is not the same as business performance. This is something very important. Just because your model is really slow doesn't mean that it doesn't bring a lot of business value and the vice versa is also true. Uh, be clear about the problem you're trying to solve. I think this is one of the key problems that a lot of people have with data science projects is like, what is the actual problem you're trying to solve? Uh, prediction serving latency matters. It doesn't matter if your recommendation engine is really, really good with a 95% or 99% accuracy if it takes 10 minutes to load one recommendation. Uh, get early feedback on model quality. So the feedback loop needs to be a lot tighter in terms of like deploying data, uh, working on data projects and finally, Test the business impact of your models using randomized control trials. So this means test it. Uh, you need to have kind of almost like A-B testing on your models to see does it actually perform better with the model versus with your previous stuff. Uh, schema.io, this I think would be near and dear to a lot of people. So what this is is basically, um, now I don't use SQL at work. We run a no SQL shop, but I think for people who do use SQL, uh, changing your schema is probably a pain in the ass. You probably don't want to do it at all if you can. So the thing about schema.io is it basically allows you to define your schema as a set of create table statements, and then it will actually kind of track whenever you want to add things to your tables, 
you just add them to that list of create table statements and it will infer what are the SQL commands it needs to actually run in order to change your schema. And uh, what's really cool about this is all that stuff is stored in a dot schema dot S K E E M A config dot, uh, file. So you can actually version it in your Git repository. So that's a really cool way to like basically have versioned SQL schemas. Um, this was a really cool article from Harvard Business Review, and they were basically talking about how there's actually a huge space for analytics projects that don't need thick data. So there are analytics projects that you can run in your own department or in your own kind of team without needing to actually go outside of the team and get a huge amount of buy-in. Uh, these are the three main classes of those kind of projects. So eliminating data factories, reducing wasted times, and simplifying hands -off, handoffs. You can click the don't button later when, we get this, when you get the slides. And finally, this is, a, this is just like a pet uh, favorite of mine. So uh, Martin Fowler, who's like the, for lack of a better way of putting it, god of continuous delivery, uh, has just published the final part of this huge article basically detailing continuous delivery for ML. And this is basically, um, continuous delivery is this idea of like continuously pushing and uh, uh, your stuff to production without needing to wait for big bang releases. He talks a lot about how you actually do continuous delivery for machine learning models. And you can see some of the stuff there is like experiments tracking, end-to-end, uh, -end, you know, the end-to-end -end process. How do you actually deploy? How do you actually work with, uh, your, you know, work with your engineers and also your uh, machine learning, your ML engineers or your data scientists? And uh, I think that's it. Back to you, IS. So uh, that's pretty much it for the data, month, data dump this month. And uh, we have slides that we'll post up at the end of the meetup. And uh, just a little bit of shout out to the other meetups in KL. There are a lot of meetups in KL. You can check out this slide. And uh, there are two curations down there, a link to them. And uh, I'll put this up now and later. Right, uh, so this is basically feedback form. Uh, it would be good to have all of your feedback because we are continuously improving and we want to make this the best data community in KL. Yeah. And uh, speaker slides again is in meetup.com. For now, we're using meetup.com. I know it's kind of, uh, it's not really popular in KL, but meetup.com, we are trying to align with the other communities in uh, different countries. So uh, for now, we'll be using meetup.com. Later on, we might be using other things. Right, so yeah, Bitly, WTF, Data Council, two. <laughs> okay, now to the main event. Uh, first up, we have Hafiz from Seek Asia, who will be giving us a talk about transfer learning. Everybody give it up for Hafiz. So this is it. Do I need to hold the mic or? Yeah. What is this for then? This is for the recording. Ah, uh, OK. Cool. Hello. So I'm supposed to be actually uh, having my presenter notes around but um, for lack of better facilities, like I need to use my phone, so excuse me if I you know, keep on looking at my phone. Uh, all right, um, hold on. lots of things to hold. So transfer learning, uh, introductions, and practical industry applications, uh, which is not the original title of my talk. So like when, when data scholars are like engaged with me and ask, uh, they give a talk. So what I wanted to basically um, you know, give the title as uh, learning to transfer learnings using transfer learnings, but I, I guess like I was trying to be funny, but they didn't think I was funny, so I had to like you know use the other title instead. So uh, I'm Hafiz Kifli. I've been working for like uh, more than ten years. Uh, the bulk of that uh, is in telecom sector. Uh, was like deploying softwares and like used a lot of Unix and SQL. Uh, started uh, doing data science um, in 2015 when I was working at Agziatia Digital. And uh, now I'm at Seek Asia uh, as a data scientist. I work with a lot of uh, textual data. 
So hopefully today I'll be sharing sound opinions and giving solid advice. Uh, on to the agenda. Um, I'm going to be covering about what transfer learning is um, and why you should use it, and also um, how does it basically work intuition, intuitively. And uh, we want to like how would you go about uh, implementing transfer learning in, in your modeling activities. Uh, I'm going to be covering some case studies. Uh, of like how transfer learning is being done, and then uh, some summary. So what it is, what is transfer learning? So this is the part where I need my phone, or I'm present notes, hold on. Okay. So uh, in traditional machine learning, what we normally would have is uh, separate learning system, separate models for uh, different data sets. So example, for example, for in this case, if you want to build a classifier that predicts whether it's a blue circle or not, so we would have data in that domain, and then we, we would train a model just basically using that data set. So if you want to try and predict triangles, we would use another data set, and we would train like another model. So, so the learnings between those two things are not interconnected. Uh, and like, as if, if you're uh, used to training neural network models, uh, you know that you probably need a lot of uh, data, uh, labeled data to, to, to work with in order to be able to actually you know, build a decent model. Um, but what if you happen to, you know, uh, given to a use case like this, where you actually need to be a classifier that predicts this kind of uh, traffic light. Traffic light. Um, so this is like a, a screenshot that I took from Andre Kaparty's, uh, it was like a few months ago. Uh, talk on software 2.0, uh, where he basically shared his uh, grievances when, uh, in, in dealing with the data set at Tesla. Um, so these types of like traffic lights doesn't happen so often. And if you were to like uh, be being tasked to work with this data, so you would have problems because like there's not much sample set to 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 work with, right? So that's where like, basically transfer learning comes in. Um, so in transfer learning. Uh, if we were to actually try and build a uh, learning system to predict this uh, uh, red squares, for example, you wouldn't need as much data as you would uh, uh, when if you were like doing traditional machine learning. So what would happen is you would be able to actually distill uh, the um, learning that you get when you were training the blue circles and, and uh, purple triangles you distill that uh, model and you transfer that knowledge over to the new model that you're building to predict the, the uh, red squares. So that's where the, the word the terminology transfer learning comes from, basically. There are, of course, like if you will go to, uh, in, into the literature, there's like a lot of uh, branches of transfer learnings, uh, inductive transfer learning, transductive, uh, and unsupervised. But for the sake of this talk, uh, what I'm going to be focusing on is uh, domain adaptation, which is uh, under transductive transfer learning. So that's basically covering the taxonomy. So why should we use it? Um, so this is like a problem that I uh, ask myself, like uh, whenever like I, I encounter a complex subject, especially during my uni days, like when like when when we were learning chemistry, for example, like why why do I bother learning about this since I'm not going to use it anyway? So uh, I found that you know being motivated enough is, is actually uh, something good uh, early on because like it keeps us uh, engaged. So yeah, why should why should you uh, use uh, transfer learning? Um, it gives good performance uh, with less samples. That's one. So in this uh, particular graph, for example, uh, you have uh, a model uh, with bird uh, pre-trained models uh, compared with uh, FastX. Uh, uh, word embeddings, and then we train that and see uh, which of those uh, model types can give you better accuracy when trained on uh, IMDB reviews. Uh, so we can see that from this graph, basically, um, that the BERT uh, model can easily give you like better accuracy, even with 500. So even like fast text at 22k um, training samples. Are not, are not able to actually uh, give you that result. So less samples, 
good performance. That's one. Um, so this is probably not, not, not something that um, a typical speaker would talk about, which is like cost, right? And yeah, uh, so, but this is like the reality of things, which is like when you want to train, you need to consider like whether or not um, the things that you're training on would take a lot of time. So with less time taken, with less uh, epochs or, or, or iterations when training your model, you would basically save time. And then when you talk about time, uh, there's less compute. And by, by using less compute, there, you're basically spending less money. And data annotation. So, um, so this is like a, a problem that like us in the industry face very because like usually they, 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 in each industry there's like a specific data set that you're working on, a specific niche that you are trying to focus on, and with those things like data doesn't come uh, cheap, uh, cheaply uh, labeled. So what happens is you would need to engage with third-party vendors like Figure Eight, Appen. Or, or our local super hands and you know, ask their help to actually label this data. If you train things from scratch, you probably need like 100K or a million over samples. But with transfer learning, you probably need less than that. Like one, like 5,000 or 10,000 would be sufficiently enough for a decent accuracy. But more importantly, that uh, I guess this is like something that uh, has been raised uh, in the community as of late, is the amount of uh, carbon emissions that uh, uh, data scientists or models produce when it is being trained. So, so take this one for example. So to train one model, one, one good uh, state-of-the-art NLP models, complete with tuning and experimentation, it takes around like 33,000 pounds of uh, carbon being emitted. So that's like an equivalent of uh, one American life average for one year. So you know, save the earth, uh, use pretend models. Um, okay, so like, how does it work? Now that we're all um, motivated and pumped up and that we should be using transfer learning, so let's go over uh, a brief history on like um, how does it work in the first place. Uh, it's hard to basically uh, talk about transfer learning without going over the, uh, the thing that started the, the, the hype, I guess. I mean, transfer learning has been, uh, has been in, in, in research for, for I'm not sure donkey years, but it is this data set that basically starts uh, uh, to bring it to light and into heavy use, which is the ImageNet data set. So it is a data set that consists of like a thousand of object classes. Uh, it's been annotated like for like I don't know, millions of samples. Um, okay, I guess this is the point where I need my notes. Don't remember everything. Okay. So it's being used in the ImageNet visual competition uh, starting from 2010. So, so the graph over there talks about, uh, so it gives you the performance uh, from, for, for the winners for the years 2010 to 2017. I'm not sure whether you guys can, at the back can see it. I hope you can. Uh, so if you can see from 2010 and 2011, so the, the performance doesn't vary that much. So um, the error rate is around, hasn't reached the 25% level yet. But come 2012, something happened. So uh, Jeff Hinton and his uh, students came into, into the competition and introduced AlexNet, which is the uh, <clears throat> neural network that, are, that is on the diagram there. And that model basically blew everyone away with like more than 41% uh, improvement uh, as compared to the uh, computers in that same year. So what's so special about this model? So it's the first, basically, uh, uh, deep CNN model that's been used in the competition. And that's basically the uh, differentiator. So this is basically what's happening inside of, a, uh, of, of that particular CNN. So it's, this is like a, a research that has been done by Zyler and Ferris 2014. So they've done some work to actually try and visualize and see what is happening uh, for at each of the layer uh, of that model. So you can see that at layer one, uh, what has been captured or learned um, by that model is something really basic, which is like lines. And then as you go more uh, deeper, you would get like rounded edges. And then you get like um, shapes, like triangles and squares. 
excuse me. And then like as you go on in layer four, like over there at the top, so like my hand, can't quite reach it. But you can see like um, the shape of the dog's nose. So it, the, the patterns get quite complex as uh, the deeper the, the neural net gets. So with these kinds of trainings, right, you would benefit the, the, the model that we want to train uh, later on for let's say, uh, for example, like if you want to train object detection model, for example. So it would be nice to actually have uh, and take these uh, things that we've learned uh, based on ImageNet and then transfer that over so that uh, our, our model um, would have all of the uh, weights already pre-trained uh, to detect all of these uh, features. But what about text? Right? Let's not forget about text. Um, so for those of you who have been working with text um, in, for, in deep learning, would be familiar with this uh, picture uh, from uh, word to vec uh, So word to vec and Glove, uh, basically, um, we go to uh, word embeddings that we would normally use if we want to work with text uh, prior to 2017. Uh, basically, we place this word with the vectors that we can use. Uh, hold on. Let me see. Am I missing anything here? Okay, I think not. So, but but the missing aspect of uh, word embeddings is just that it's just it, it, it's it's trying to represent only one aspect of of the word. So, like you have like for for each particular word, you only have one uh, representation of it, like one vector. Uh, whereas uh, in Recent developments, we are now able to actually uh, represent a, a word with multiple meaning, with more context. So, for for in this case, uh, instead of just cat and there's like only one representation of it, now we we can now actually have different meanings of the word cat. So, instead of just cat as in the little sense of cat, we can also uh, represent cat as uh, in the um, analogy of it, rain cats and dogs. So the common theme of, of the, the models, the printed models that has been in, in recent developments, uh, they are all uh, language models. ELMO and followed by ULM FIT, and then uh, BERT, the most popular one of all. So all of them are language models. And what makes language models so special as a task that uh, our printed models are training on is that it, it, it is able to encapsulate uh, the syntactical nature of text and the semantics of it. As compared to like if you want to simply train a uh, the pre-trained model on a different set of tasks like semantics, uh, semantic uh, analysis, for example. So it has been found that language model uh, can, can give you more information on that. Uh, so how to do it? So let me take a breather here. How do we actually do it? Uh, the general approach is to just um, take any pre-trained models and then, so in this case, uh, this is an example for an image uh, classification problem. So we would take uh, a, a pre-trained uh, image model like um, ResNet or VGG, and then uh, put a classifier on top of that. Take your domain data or whatever uh, task that you have uh, in, in mind to, to be actually build a model with, and then uh, train it. But how, how exactly do you actually train it? So these are basically the, the, the rough strategies that you can take if you want to train, <coughs> or if you want to fine tune your, your pre-trained models. So it's divided into like four quadrants, depending on your data set size, and how similar is your data set uh, according uh, with your task at hand. If let's say in quadrant one, for example, if you have a large data set, but the, the pre-trained model is of a a different uh, distribution, then you might want to actually uh, train the entire model, uh, the classifier, and all the way. So, for example, if, if you have a pre trained model using uh, ImageNet data set, and then what you're trying to actually uh, classify is aliens from outer space. So, this is like something that you don't have a sample on. Um, but, but then it so happened that you will actually have a lot of pictures uh, of. of those extraterrestrial terrestrial. So what you do you would do to, to, to build a classifier to to the, to being to be able to classify the aliens is you would train the entire model uh, 
So let's just talk over here. So white means that it's frozen and uh, blue is being trained. Uh, if you would have in Quadrant 2, for example, a large data set, uh, but the data is somewhat similar to what your problem is, then you probably wouldn't want to basically train the whole thing. You wouldn't want the, the learned features of those edges and lines to disappear. You would only uh, train the uh, layers close to the classifier. So you would let the uh, early pre-trained models, uh, layers of the pre-trained models to be uh, static and frozen. Quadrant uh, 3, small data set, different pre-trained models. You would uh, leave some parts of your uh, pre-trained models as, uh, to, to be frozen. And in quadrant 4, since uh, you have a small data set, uh, you wouldn't want to train that whole model. You, want, you, don't want, you wouldn't want to damage the things that have been learned in your pre-trained models. So you just train your uh, classifier and then let the pre-trained models to be frozen. So uh, a case study. Uh, Motivating reviews. So this is basically something that uh, I've uh, worked on at work. So to give you some context, uh, I'm from SIG, and SIG is distributed across the world. And uh, we don't only deal with uh, English text, we also deal with other languages like uh, Spanish and Portuguese. So for today's uh, sharing, I'll be talking about a use case that I've uh, worked on uh, over in our one of our brands in uh, Mexico. So this is basically one uh, a page of our product. Uh, any of you speak Spanish? See? Si? Okay. Anyways, I've, okay. So I've blanked out a few of those items since I don't want to get sued or anything. Uh, but but what it basically means is uh, it's company profiles. It's basically a place where we let uh, candidates. Uh, Bitch about like their workplace and then give ratings um, if they don't like uh, where they're working at. This is uh, some samples of uh, the reviews that candidates uh, would leave uh, on that page. Pretty much a lot of, like less store. But the problem with um, reviews is that you know, people can get really creative sometimes and then they really leave like really rude comments and toxic. Uh, some are just like super biased towards you know being positive. You're not even sure whether it's an advertisement, some can be really negative, probably they just get, got psyched or something. Uh, others are prejudice. Uh, it can get like really defamatory. We've seen like names being mentioned there, and uh, some are just downright relevant, uh, just like random spams and stuff like that. So how do you deal with this? So um, early on, uh, what we've done is we've uh, <clears throat> Uh, we've asked our internal moderators to basically help sort this thing out, uh, whether a review should be blocked or not blocked. But as the product uh, grew, uh, it gets a bit harder, and a lot, uh, like a lot of expenses needs to be uh, uh, incurred because, like, our moderators are just like a few. But bulk of the work is uh, we outsource it to like uh, third-party vendors, like. Uh, Figure eight or super hands, for instance, and like for each like labels that they give, it's like we're not only like asking for this like one label. Uh, it's like multiple because like we want to make sure that uh, the majority of them uh, can agree on the same rating. So yeah, it can get quite costly. So we've decided to basically uh, try to optimize that. Uh, a, cl a classifier basically right, a, 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 a yes or no review block or not block reviews. Seems simple, right? I mean, it's just a text classifier. What can what can go wrong, right? But it's the reality is, is like model building is never straightforward. You you like le left in a not like you you're happy, happy so you're not you're unsure. Uh, so yeah, I mean uh, Spanish, right? Uh, the product itself um, um, didn't didn't acquire a lot of uh, label data. So that's a problem. What else can go wrong? Imbalance classes. So um, when I say imbalance, like if you were to predict like every single uh, reviews that you get and you just let it pass through, like don't block, you would get like 90% accuracy. So like, so this is like a problem for us because like not only we have like small uh, sample, uh, small label data, it's it's also imbalance, and then it's it's in Spanish. So like, so okay, so why is you know? text in Spanish a bad thing, 
right? It's, it's, why is it that, why, why is it a problem, right? So this is basically a tweet that I uh, got from uh, Twitter, uh, basically from from Swa Kole, uh early this morning, to, to, be, to be exact, and he was talking about uh, the difficulty of working in uh, NLP research because like a lot of the data sets and research uh, revolves around uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, language uh, and Anglo Anglosphere, basically English language. A, a lot of literature are all about the English text. And this is a problem because like, this means that the, all, the, all the pretend models and uh, models and research is geared towards English. So we don't have pretend models for Bahasa. We don't have pretend models for Spanish from the get-go. Right? So when we talk about like, you know, training like huge corpus uh, uh, of uh, Wikipedia or the, or the entire web, and we want to have like, a good, decent Bahasa pretend models, we don't, we don't have that. And that's the problem. So how do we approach about uh, going about solving this problem? So, like the problem is a problem, but I, need, I still need to solve it. Um, going back to what, what we've discussed, oops, sorry, previously, uh, we have our pretend model. So there's a few options there. We could just opt for the typical word embeddings like word to vec, or we could use something like BERT or GPT to represent our text. And then there's uh, the domain data that we want to fine tune with. Uh, in this case, it's the review data. Uh, and then we train a task, uh, a simple like block or not block. Um, so selecting a pretend model, that in itself is a problem because like there's a whole lot of uh, models that has can uh, come out uh, after BERT has been released. Uh, but this is basically trying to map out like uh, which models, what are the predecessors uh, of that model, and a lot of these models, basically the underlying architecture of it is uh, the transformer uh, model, with the exception of ULM fit, which is like right over there uh, beside Elmo, which is using RNN. So we had good experience with BERT previously uh, when we were training our classifier for uh, the English market, because it's easy. Uh, the English model is there, so BERT becomes the, the uh, go-to choice. But uh, so so we we we, we thought that um, yeah why not give bird multilingual a try right so we're working in Spanish why not give bird multilingual a try but as it turns out like after we've done a few tests um, uh, the performance of bird multilingual isn't as good as uh, a single language pretend model so so eventually we've had to swap bird with fast AI limpet so what we did here to basically uh, build our own um, language model that is uh, based in Spanish is we take Wikipedia Spanish corpus and then we train it from scratch using fit architecture and from there uh, we fed in our company reviews which we thought at first it would uh, be a, not, not a problem but uh, as, as they say garbage in garbage out right so a lot of the uh, reviews, as, as, as it were, contains a lot of spam. So we had to add this feature in so that it filters off all of this garbage first before we fine tune our pretend model. So we found that if, let's say, we were to just let the garbage in, it, it, it affects uh, how good our pretend model uh, behaves as well. With regards to pretend models, uh, the corpus is a corpus. Any pretend models would have uh, to have a uh, a specific task that it's trying to solve to come up with this, those weights that uh, you're trying to transfer over. So for for our pretend models, we uh, were training it to be a uh, to be a language model, which is to basically predict the next word. And from the author of uh, Fast AI, uh, that the development fit. So what he mentioned, what Jeremy Howard mentioned, was that uh, you don't really need to actually train your language model to be perfect. It doesn't really need to uh, be actually super accurate. You, it, roughly okay is good enough. And what he found during his studies was that. Um, sometimes like uh, decently performing language models can actually give you a better overall performance. Uh, so in this case, like a classifier, uh, that's what we need. Uh, there's also data augmentation. Um, okay, I think I forgot my notes. Okay. So 
So this organization came from uh, after staying in the water for a while, and you know you get back the matrix. You want to improve the, the, the performance further because like uh, when you release more, like I said, it seems that you are not able to get that uh, threshold that your stakeholder needs. So that's when like you need to embark on a, a journey of error analysis and try to understand like uh, of all the guidelines that, that your review uh, is violating, which one of those that um, is being triggered the most. And from there, you probably like, you want to like add in more samples, sometimes uh, mock samples of those uh, particular category that, it's, uh, that your model keeps on missing. Sometimes it's uh, some uh, vocabulary that, has, that, that, that your training set hasn't uh, seen before, so you probably need to introduce those words inside your mock uh, data when you, when you do fine tuning. Uh, finally, like when, when, when you're done with the fine tuning stage and then you get to the classifier, so this is when like, again, uh, the spam filter and the data augmentation part needs to be done. But sometimes the label itself is wrong. So this is like sometimes like you, you would think that the goal that set is the goal that set, but sometimes it's wrong. This is like, this is like why you actually really need to uh, have a look at your data and understand like why why is your like model keeps on like you know working in, in, in weird ways and and uh, like like for me for instance like when I look at certain certain text uh, and look at the predictions um, to me the models looks okay but according to according to the goal that I set uh, it should be predicted the other way so this is like when I would probably go to the uh, annotators in this case like our own internal moderator team and then uh, you know, ask them to verify and uh, see whether the uh, label should be overturned. To sum it up, um, transfer learning basically takes uh, uh, the model, the learning from one model from one task and applies it to another. It's been proven to give better results, with less time, samples, and cost. Uh, in terms of feasibility of the model, it really depends on the similarity of your model. Uh, the closer that you can get uh, pre-trained models to match what your, your is the easier your, your job will be. Understand your data. Uh, pay like pay a lot of time in examining the quality and, and the labels, whether whether or not the text actually makes sense. Uh, and yeah, uh, model building is never straightforward. And every analysis is like uh, really your friend. So thank you. Um, I'm open to questions. I guess uh, how many minutes do I have? Or if let's say yeah, you can meet afterwards. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, nice talk. I was just curious on the uh, problem that you were solving and the use case. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of training a Spanish model, this would would the approach of actually just translating everything to English and then using a available English model uh, be viable? Yes, it, it is a viable technique if uh, your if the uh, matrix, let's say you were to do that and then the matrix meets what your stakeholder needs, then yeah, by, by all means you can do that. Uh, do that. Uh, but also like consider the cost of translating the text in the first place. If you're using Google Translate, then that might incur some cost. If you're using some internal language translation engine, then that's probably fine. Yeah. So in, in our case, uh, a spam is like uh, something that is really subjective. So uh, from what I've seen from the data set, it's just uh, merely like repeated sentences and uh, like gibberish being, 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 being written and then just one, one word uh, comments. So we consider those like irrelevant and we don't really need to. But so it's probably not this, the, the more complex spams that you're thinking of. So we didn't we didn't build that, but we found that uh, just by introducing those rules, uh, it's good enough. Uh, 
So we were using ngram techniques to actually do that. Oh, one more question. So, uh, in terms of like what gets learned, um, to be honest, I have no answer for that because like, uh, I haven't really dived into that research for that particular topic yet. But like, if it depends on your problems, like certain free trained models are good for certain things. If you are looking for like to solve uh, problems that revolves around syntax, probably Elmo is a better be better uh, uh, free trained models to use because um, when it was uh, trained, the objective was to actually do that, as as compared to like William Fib or, or but it was designed to act on a separate task. So so I'm sorry that I couldn't give you like a straight answer on on what's been transferred over. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk later. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, next up we have Ashik John from REA, who's gonna be talking about their Ansel engineering practices. Everybody give it up. Okay. Okay. Again, testing one, two, three. Testing one, three. Okay. Make sure everything's okay. Again. So good evening, guys, and welcome to iAsia. I'm John. I'm a data engineer at iAsia, and this is my colleague Ashik, who is also a data engineer at iAsia. So today we'll talk about uh, data engineering at IA Group Asia. The challenges to face uh, our tech stack and our uh, data engineering practices. Okay, uh, this, this is the same slide. So, uh, okay. So, before today, who here heard of IA Group? Okay, I see a, a few hands. So, we, IA Group, is a global business that no property like no other. We are a prop tech company. Our business is to provide a platform for property seekers, agent, and developer, which represent the uh, property market. We are headquartered in Australia, Melbourne. We are a number one brand in uh, Australia and Malaysia. We have presence in various countries. As you can see, we have presence in Australia, US, India, and Asia. So that's IA Group, but we are IA Asia, which is a part of IA Group. IA Asia operate eight brands across six countries. Those brands are, as you might know, I have property in Malaysia, I have property in Singapore, uh, Roma Tree, Indonesia, and Prakat, Thailand. So, as a prop tech company, we know data is very important for our business. So much so that we have our own team for data, the data service team at iAsia. So, we deal with data uh, from data engineering, data science, and the lots. So, data is a very uh, wide area that we have four squads here at uh, Asia. We have the uh, data engineering squad, which is responsible for data uh, modeling, data processing, and data cleansing. So they do stuff like writing SQL queries, they uh, clean data, they write data schema, and a lot of data wrangling. Next, we have the dev squad, which is responsible for data architecture, data processing, uh, I mean, uh, uh, software engineering. So we uh, build data platforms, we decide if we should use Hadoop, we should use Spark, or we should use uh, Google Dataflow. Uh, in short, we make sure data come in our system, it gets processed and it gets out in the right format, in uh, low latency and free of error. 
Next, we have the BI squad, which uh, they do they view uh, their pipelines and they do uh, ETL uh, processing. Sorry, I meant uh, BI dashboard. So any any uh, W user here? Uh, so those are your folks. You might apply with Alien later if you are interested in W. And finally, we have the very sexy and exciting uh, AI and machine learning uh, squad. So they do stuff like AI and machine learning. So here at iAsia, they uh, build recommendation engine, they uh, predict house prices, and they also uh, do image recognition. So they predict whether image is a condo apartment, is it a two bed bedroom, or is it a three, three uh, bed bedroom, or is it a cat? <laughs> So today we have a representative from Two Squad today. I'm John. I'm from the uh, Dev Squad. So I'll talk more on the uh, tech issues, the tech challenges we face, and how we solve them. And Ashik is from the uh, Data Engineering Squad. So he'll talk more about data issues and how we solve them, and of course some other issues. Uh, so about uh, our tech challenges we face. So as a uh, property company, we have a lot of data every day. We have listing data, we have uh, agent data coming from all four markets. So we need a large scale data processing system that can process data from various sources. And those data in turn need to get processed to answer business questions. So we need fast reporting for business decision. Business users often want those data answered easily, accurate and fast. Better still if you can, pro you can answer them near real time, which brings me to my next challenge. We sometimes need a real time event processing, querying, and an analytics solution. So, if let's say a, a user click on a listing, we want to act immediately on that data. We want to alert the agent immediately that someone has clicked on their listing. We want to act on that data to provide the most relevant recommendation back to that user. But all of these uh, applications is useless if you don't have. Uh, secure and safe environment. So we also need to provide a, a data security and data protection to prevent data breaches and data from being stolen. And of course, as a tech company, the tech landscape is always changing. We want to experiment with new technology. We want to try out the latest uh, AI algorithm for the best recommendation. So we need low experimentation costs. To do that, we need low infrastructure costs and, and fast deployment. If we can achieve that, we can uh, easily scale across market. Today, we have four markets, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore. But if suddenly a business acquire a new market, let's say Philippines, you want to quickly scale to that market fast. So how do we do that? Uh, so this is our uh, data acquisition and processing architecture, which is completely hosted on the cloud. That means we don't have to worry about infrastructure, setting up hardways and can straight go away to setting up the data pipelines and deploy our solution. So we have uh, a very vanilla architecture. We have the data source layer. We have the ETL layer, which is extract, transform, and load. We have our storage layer. And lastly, we have the publish and insight delivery layer. So what kind of data do we uh, analyze at iAsia? We have the normal RDBMS, which is, which is your MySQL and SQL Server. These are normal databases to store our business data like listing, agent, and uh, maybe property data. We also need to process flat file data like your Excel sheet, Google sheet, or your CSV file. We also have uh, APIs to consume external data. And uh, a very important piece of data is our Google Analytics data, which we use to store consumer traffic, consumer clicks, consumer behavior. And uh, we also do ad campaigns on Google Ads and also uh, Facebook. So to, to uh, measure how our ads are performing, we uh, capture digital marketing data and store them. Lastly, we need to handle internal data like sales source. So that's for our data sources. Next, we'll proceed to the uh, ETL layer, uh, which how we move data from the data sources into our storage layer. So we have two kind of uh, ETL. We have batch ETL, meaning we the ETL happen at, at a schedule interval. Let's say we fetch listing data every day into our BigQuery. That's batch processing. And we also have uh, real-time streaming, 
many of the data is being uh, continuously processed and uh, inserted into BigQuery. So for batch processing, we use Cloud Composer. Cloud Composer is Airflow hosted on GCP. We have various data connector in our Cloud Composer. We can, it can connect to uh, Google Sheet APIs and RDBMS. It connects to those data and pump them into BigQuery. So that's for uh, batch processing. For real-time data streaming, we have uh, two kinds of data. We have a continuous stream of data that comes in continuously at a uh, considerable volume. For this, we use the combination of uh, Google Cloud PubSub and Google Dataflow. So uh, think of PubSub like uh, Apache Kafka. It's a buffering layer where, where data get uh, stored temporarily while it's being uh, picked up and processed by Cloud Dataflow to be persisted in our uh, storage layer. So that's for a continuous stream of uh, data. But we also have uh, data that comes irregularly, that are data which, which are sparse. So these are data like uh, marketing feed from Facebook. Uh, maybe one lead will come every hour or every, every minute. But the quantity is quite few. For this, we use a clock function. So these events are being handled by a clock function process and persisted in uh, our data lake and warehouse. So that's it for our ETL layer. Next, uh, we have our storage layer. So for structured and unstructured data, we use BigQuery. For unstructured data, we use uh, Google Cloud Storage. We use BigQuery because it's a fully managed uh, data warehousing solution. Uh, storage cost and analytics cost is completely separated. You can store data for very cheap and you only get charged for how many data you query. And uh, for unstructured data, we use uh, cloud storage. That's it for our data and wells. Next, we move to the uh, publishing and inside the delivery layer. So when the data is in the, our data lake, we need to surface those, those data to uh, business and also to consumer. To surface our data to uh, business, we use Tableau. Uh, but Tableau is quite pricey. We also use uh, Google Data Studio to surface our data to business user through dashboard. So in between BigQuery and uh, W, we have a caching layer using a BI engine. BI engine is basically a, a in-memory caching layer for fast data retrieval. So besides serving a business user, we also need to service our data to end consumer like you and me. So we build uh, microservices to surface this data to end consumer. We have data like transaction history uh, and also point of interest for your property so user can uh, know when was this building trans last transacted at your convenience of your tablet or your web so that's it for our data acquisition and processing architecture i'll, pa I'll pass to ashik to talk more about the etl okay oops oh, do you need this Okay, uh, whenever we talk about any data engineering, anything, always come uh, talk, need to talk about the ETL things, and it's the pain. In maybe in the middle of the night, you will get the uh, error message that your ETL is not working, and uh, suddenly your manager will come to find, say, you have to add the new ETLs for this, 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 this in, in, in one day or half a day, something like that. So when we talk about the ETL things, we found that may, most of guests we do the batch processing for 95% guess. Batch processing, not the real time things. And when we talk about the batch processing, we found that we can solve 90% problems using only a SQL transformation, not anything else. Just from source data, you're getting data into with SQL, maybe from a data lake to another data lake, same way you are doing the SQL transformation. But what happens? When we get any new ETL task, we found that we are writing a SQL transformation with source data configuration, destination data configuration, and uh, scheduling, many, many other things. All are actually the same task. 
then why we need to create same things for thousands time developer should concentrate only the ETL logic not the set up the schedule set up the source and destination anything so we had this kind of problems and about the tax hierarchy say one ETL if fail it should stop the next ETL and it should not affect the last report so how can we communicate with each other so that's why we built our own ETL tools ETL ninja how it works and how we communicate everything there say one developer created one SQL and he wrote a configuration file in YML that's it his work is done what it will do that ETL ninja will read that YML configuration file it will create a DAG for Google Composer, I mean the year for. So it will create the DAG, the hierarchy, everything, and it will automatically upload that DAG into the Composer. So you don't need to configure this uh, source, you don't need to configure this destination, you don't need to configure the schedule, you don't need to configure the hierarchy of the uh, ETL things, everything will be configure from that configuration file that's it so using that things we found we migrated our legacy 400 ETL jobs just in couple of hours that's done so and these ETL ninja actually run based on the CI CD I mean you guys you can use any other CI CD for platform that's okay so now we are concentrating only ETL logic, not about setup configuration for the ETLs. This first challenge we solved this way. Now, about the data structure. John already mentioned that we actually uh, serving many markets, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and previously they worked separately. So they have everything, their own data structure. But when we're serving the property business, actually things are connected and say everything is same. So if I talk about a property, it should have a facilities, it should have a room number, it should have a price, things actually same. And if we say the location, it's same. If we talk about the point of interest, it's same. Transaction things, same. So why we should have maintained multiple table for that things? So then, this is the one challenge previously. And source data can be structured, unstructured, semi structure, many things. And all of our market actually support multi linguist any kind of linguist. Previous system, we had more and more columns for each linguist. Now, if we go for the India, they have more than 20 linguists. Should we create 20 columns for that one? No, it doesn't make sense. So also, that about the legacy system about the new system about the new all sources we need to create a association so for that should we create multiple association table for that one doesn't make sense and about new challenges every day we found new requirement new data points new things should we create new columns new tables for new data set doesn't make sense because you have to update your api your endpoint everything just for new column thing so this was what our challenges and i like to share now how we solve this kind of challenges so first first we have created a single dynamic database system database structure for all common problems say like location say like properties py transaction anything so legacy system we are serving five markets but for that we had 30 more tables now we have nine tables it can serve any number of markets any and it have unlimited capabilities so like linguist things and all how first say from different sources we are getting data and storing in the single system maybe all of them got id but see it's a integer id or something then we used universal unique id for data uniqueness so whatever the source is whenever the data is coming everything is unique this is the one point second relational table for data association with association type it's very interesting so 
one building have old address structure, new address structure, but actually the same building. Then we created an association in that particular table. But with the association type, it's a building duplicate. That's it. Why do we are talking about the location hierarchy? Say one province has 10 districts, under the district we have sub district, under the sub district we have several areas, many things. Should we create separate table for each province, district, sub district things? Doesn't make sense. Because for every market, every country, we have to create a hundreds of tables to maintain only this location data. So then we created only one table to maintain all the location data. But how can we solve the hierarchy? We created another table, a relational association table for that all location. So now we can maintain which district is under which subdistrict, which subdistrict is under which area or anything, just by association type and parent ID, parent-child relationship. That's it. So two tables solve all this. And next, we uh, think about the hybrid data structure for our data lake. So sometimes we store our data in a relational way, sometimes normalized, sometimes denormalized, sometimes no SQL. Even for data warehouse, we are using star schema, back dimension. So we are not binding our brain and think thought that for data lake, all should be in the same structure or same way. Doesn't make sense. For based on our problem, we restructured everything inside there. Next, talk about the nested data. It's a very nice feature of BigQuery. We found so previously, <coughs> we stored maximum data into JSON format or something like, which is ARM structure or semi structure, something like that. But here, nested is very nice things. Say you can put multiple columns in a single column and in a repeated way. So, seems like you can put an entire table inside a cell. So there, we added only three columns, three definitions. One is type, another is language code, another is the name. So, if we talk about the location, say Hong Kong is a location, it got an ID. So, it's a one row. Inside that row, we have a, a language alias, for simplified language, Chinese language, language alias for traditional Chinese language, and abbreviation as a HK, display name as a Hong Kong with uppercase lowercase. So whatever the information about the Hong Kong, everyone, everything is we are putting there in a row, not in a column. So whenever new things or new attributes or new information will come for Hong Kong, we're putting there just using a alternate name type. That's it. Even for any language. So end of the day, we are starting business through a view. So we can reconstruct any data from there. No need to add new column, new things. About the JSON, we also stored a couple of data into JSON. But what kind of? Some data is not that much structure. Maybe from source, we got a couple of data. We will not use that frequently. So why do we need to put this in a single column or something like that? We store the whole legacy data in there. Sometimes we have very uncommon information. Say, when we talk about a point of interest, maybe you like to think about airport. Airport has uh, domestic airport, international airport type. But it doesn't have for school, transport, other transportation, education, even for hospital things. See, it's a very specific information for a specific group, specific data. No need to put in into a separate column or anything. So we can put this type uncommon data fields into JSON. So it's kind of hybrid things. And another interesting thing is attribute table, utility attribute table. How it works? Say, we have a school data information. All is school. Say, there is a school type. Kindergarten, primary, secondary, something. And we have a uh, hospital type. We have a transportation type. Should we store all type of information with each PI data in each row? 
no need what we are doing we are storing all definition type things dimension type things in a single comma single table with attribute type that's it and end of the day we are sharing the id in the part, uh, perfect place so when we change any information board for that attribute it will be changed for everywhere no need to change in a particular records or things even we can keep the alternate language alternate display name alternate short name large name anything all related of them just like location so all together when we have to maintain more than 100 tables then now we can maintain just 10 to 15 tables will be good enough to maintain all of these and if we scale our business we go for more 10 or 20 markets still our system is same still our data structure is same still our api is same no need extra efforts this was about the data structure design things now about data authentication challenges obviously we have to serve our data into different market in different departments uh, just like data mart or something like that previously we were storing all required information in a separate table or separate data mart or something then we found then if we can create a dynamic filter for user based or in end user based then we don't need to maintain separate tables or things so our plan was to serving data for bi or data analyst using role wise data access anytime we can revoke or assign any role to any end user the user can be a gcp user or non gcp user anyone anyone and we need to get filter the data cell level not the row only row plus column cell level data filter and we should store all things in the single structure for same kind of data set it should be faster and whatever the filter we are doing it should be hidden from the end user how you solve these things say so here you can see the architecture for our data authentication we are getting data from different source bi google analytics google ads facebook any other data source uh, relational data source google ads manager all are coming into bigquery then we are using staging for data processing and end of the day we have aggregated reported data this is the final data but it contains all markets all departments data then how we can filter another in bigquery we are also storing all kind of authentication things say like for role wise one role in which table which uh, where condition and what select table things say which column we will select which data we will filter everything goes into our uh, bigquery auth view based on each user so it's totally about access related information filtering so we have filter conditions there we have own data set now how how we are filtering things from the end person say like google spreadsheet um, bigquery ui or data study everywhere we have a user id i mean the email id so from there we are feeding user id here with a single join condition into sql simple sql just using that sql we are filtering aggregated data based on the user for that user and end of the day we are getting the filter reported data and we are serving this filter reported data in all places either google spreadsheet or bi or any other data source everywhere for performance we added the bi engine to get the in memory data process for end user sometimes we use community connector to get a static dashboard and sometimes we use bigquery connector where we give the whole access on whole data set however based on the user all data is filtered there already so anytime if we change the role in filter layer 
it will be filtered at the end of the so anytime we can assign any role new permission or revoke everything and data will be served based on the filter no need to maintain anything for data revoke or anything like so this is the different challenges we have faced and solved in our way and uh, as data change technology change everything changes very rapidly in a cities in this world we are always ready for new challenges so any question thank you Personalizing, no, nothing. Okay. Say one simple example I can give. Say I have a user ID A, Hashi, and there we have a three column. One column contains the data source, I mean the table name. One column contains the row filter conditions, say like market number or market name or market code, something. And one column contains the list of select conditions columns thing so when we are joining this view with the data it, we use where condition to filter row we use table name from that uh, source and we use the select columns from that column values that's it it's a very simple sql transformation Is it continuously? Uh, no, actually, every data filter based on the SQL view, and when you are anywhere logging there, BigQuery has the interesting things session user. From the session user, we always get the who is the user. So easily we can filter. And if we use the, um, say, like community connector, there is a way to pass the user ID into the SQL. You can inject user ID there. So from there, also we can filter who is the user and what is his, uh, the row, column, and table name. So, and end of the day, actually this layer is hidden into a, a different view with a different view. So end user will never know how the data is filtered, but it's no need to store or regenerate the whole filtered data set again and again. Just a simple example. Anyone else? Question? All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, anybody else? Hey, I'm from Fave. I'm hiring. <laughs> yeah, so Fave is looking for data analysts, data engineers, and also lead software engineers. If you guys have any uh, interest, you can, or you want to know more about the job, you can look for me. Or you can also visit our careers page, careers.fave.com. And if there is nobody else, we'd like to conclude tonight. Uh, thank you all again for coming. I know it's very tough to get to these venues and just for your night. And uh, but yeah, thanks again. And this is the feedback form. Please send us your feedback, and we'll make the sessions better in the future. A uh, little bit of teaser. Next month we have it in Money Lion, and uh, look forward to some good talks then. Right. Thank you. Oh wait, wait. Just stay where you are. Where exactly where you are? We'll take a picture. Actually, uh, those of you on the side, maybe you can come this way. The photo will be like this. Someone.